Welcome to So You're Kinda a Big Deal, a weekly podcast deep diving into the lives of emerging and established tattoo artists. Listen in as we dig into origin stories, industry hot topics, and what it takes to survive in the world of tattooing. This is Tattoo Shop Talk. It's funny, it's crass, inspiring, and sometimes we get it right. Join your hosts Sean Headley and Dave Allen every week as we host a new guest. The Whole Fast Social Club keeps expanding and adding features to make the life of tattooers easier. We just launched a classified section for pros only. Sell your tattoo gear, prints, whatever in one spot. No sus scratchers. This is on top of a platform with peer to peer vouching, direct connect, a wait list, and geo searching. Now you can find guest spots or forever homes at studios everywhere. No guessing, no awkward conversations. See what shops or artists have to offer. Mark them as favorites or add yourself to their wait list to let them know you are interested. Hold Fast Social Club keeps adding features to make connecting easy. Pros only. A place for the best... Homestead Tattoo is where you will find Kevin Pregitzer applying old classic style Japanese tattoos in a warm and inviting atmosphere. This private studio can be found in Calgary, Alberta, online at KevinPYYC and HomesteadTattooYYC.com. Everyone knows Dave and I have a good guy connection. But we also have that with most respected supply companies. Working alongside Lucas at Classic Tattoo, I saw firsthand the blood, sweat, and pressure he was under to provide top quality products. He knew I'd shit all over his ideas if they sucked. He also knew that many online would follow suit. Being passionate and having a deep connection to producing products your peers will use and love is no small task. With Lucas, Rob, and Natalie at the helm, you know exactly what you're getting. High quality products, fairly priced with excellent customer service. Shop, support, good guy supply. The Hold Fast Social Club presents So You're Kinda a Big Deal with your hosts, Sean Headley and Dave Allen. more this is your life are you ready <laughs> well no. so this is going to be our last episode we ever do because we finally got you on yeah <laughs> yeah <right. laughs> we got him blocked already yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right before we start all this stuff we just got to say thanks to good guy supply you know and of course hold that social club for being able to make all this content possible uh yeah so you're kind of a big deal tell us a little bit about yourself steve moore and about your first tattoo you did in may 1993 oh I... oh look at nardmore you saw it's all out eh? <laughs> uh what was my first tattoo it was on my friend peter anderson it was nope. in my room what your first tattoo was the moro snowboard logo on yourself oh on myself Right, yeah, okay. How do you know that? You remember that? Your first tattoo was also your first tattoo. Yeah, which is kind of (laughs) silly, right? That was a bad idea. (laughs) Hey, but it gave you your first cover-up practice. There you go. right, it did. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I guess my second tattoo on a person was um, Peter Anderson, my friend Peter Anderson. And I did these three tribal sharks that were about this big swimming in a circle. And just the outline took me three hours, which I don't even, I don't even know how that's possible now. Like, like how, you know, did your sweat wear off his stencil? Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember (laughs) just the sweat dripping. Three hours. Yeah. I don't know how that's possible, but anyway, yeah, that was it. You stippled it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, so then now this marks your 30 year of tattooing. Yeah. yeah I mean, amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Wow, that's a big Thanks. milestone. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah I, I kept thinking, oh, I should like make a post or something. And then I 
I didn't because then it requires, you know, putting your face Thanks. out there and, you know, doing the stuff. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I just went, went back into my shell and I was like, no, yeah. Make a t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I should actually, that'd be a good idea. That would be awesome. How about you? Like, how long have you been tattooing, Sean? 33 years. 33. Wow. Crazy. Technically longer if you count non-professional tattooing. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. But, yeah. Not but, yeah. Oh, that's Crazy. fucking tattooing. Yeah. So a yeah. long time. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 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 So crazy. Yeah. That's funny. Right. You remember those tattoos that I have, the little first one. So I have a cheat sheet. I have oh, your, oh you wrote it I down. have your old interview that oh. we did for my book that didn't get published. Remember I sent you pictures oh, yeah, of it? Yeah. Yeah, that's so awesome. So I have that yeah. and I just reread it because it's just oh. way too funny. <laughs> Is it? Because <laughs> we well, no, just like your early years. Like I don't think people yeah, yeah, understand. Yeah. Like, and I remember it's even cool. I read I reread not that long ago your interviews in um oh my god, why tattoo artist magazine. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, and when you talk about Dave, Psycho Dave, yeah. from Toronto, all that stuff, you know what I mean? Like you just have so many yeah. great stories. But anyway, let's start back at your humble beginnings in Toronto Absolutely. and tattooing your skater friends and how yeah. you got into your first shop slash apprenticeship. Um, so yeah, I had a bunch of skater friends, you know, being a skateboarder and they all started to get tattooed and then they were like, you know. Steve, you can draw, like, draw me a thing. I want to get tattooed. And I was like, oh, okay. So I did some drawings for people, you know, and they went and got them tattooed. And then they came in and I was like, oh, you know, that's my drawing forever. You know, you have my drawing forever. And then I remember being like, really like, whoa, that's like awesome. Like, I want to try that, you know? And, uh, and I wanted to get some tattoos and I was just like, how do we do this? And then I had this friend, um, Andrew Graham skateboarder and he was getting tattoos and he told me about studio one in Toronto. And so I went down there with him and I got like, you know, my first machine and, and like, a, I think I just got a, a bottle of black ink, you know, Smart. Like I didn't yeah. get colors or anything. You know, I had to like, I didn't have any money. So I just got a couple things and stuff he needed to get going. And, and then I started tattooing my buddies and then they, they had a friend that wanted to get tattooed. And then all of a sudden it was like random People and I was like, I really don't know what I'm doing. You know, like I watched my friend. Um, oh, shoot, I'm trying to think of his name now. There was a guy in Ontario that tattooed a lot of the skaters too. Shoot, his name escapes me. Anyway, but I remember he tattooed his own shoulder with like the Danzig logo. West. Oh, cool. And anyways, so um, it wasn't you know, Thor? Was hung it? out. No, no, it wasn't Thor. No, um, but. Uh, yeah, so I was, you know, messing around with that stuff. And then I guess I tattooed one of my friends on his whole back. And then he went to, remember that band Biohazard? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Biohazard. He went to a show and they had some kind of tattoo contest. They invited people up on stage and then they like, you know, gave people prizes or something to show their tattoos. Because probably at that time it was very, you know, uh, not too many people had tattoos and it was like pretty, you know, hardcore. Yeah, and uh, so this guy Chris went up on Chris Tidwell. God, I'm remembering these names. This is amazing. Uh, but he went up on stage and he got like a prize or something. And so Psycho Dave was at the show and he saw it, and then he like phoned me up. He got the guy to give me his. Oh wait, he got my number from him, and then he phoned me up and he was like, you know, I work at this shop and you should come down and check it out. And I didn't really realize, you know, what an awesome opportunity that was. I was totally like. Oh, okay. You know, like, yeah, let's do that. You know, so I, you know, I drive down to Toronto and, and then I, I get to this shop and it's like, you know, crazy Aces shop. And it was like proper biker shop. Everyone's super heavily tattooed and they look like they're, you know, straight off like a rock and roll stage. And I just roll up, you know, my skate clothes and like, hey. and, um, so I got to go in there and, and then I, I met Psycho and, um, and then they were like, oh, yeah, just hang out a couple of days, you know? And I was like, okay. So I just kind of hung out with them and watched them. Had no idea what was happening, right? And then at the end of the three days, like, Ace is all like, hey, you know, I want you to tattoo yourself. And then I'm going to look at it. And I was like, okay. So then I, like, 
I remember I tattooed an ankle band on myself. Like I went around my ankle. I, I twisted. I was all in these weird positions, you know, and Ace would come in and look at me and I was like, had my foot like all sideways. And, and then he looked at it after and he was all like, oh, that's pretty good, you know? And then he was just like, yeah, you want to start tomorrow? And I was like, okay, you know? <laughs> and then, uh, and then I went into like, you know, a proper apprenticeship. Like, you know, you have to pay, um, you know, you got a lower percentage and he showed me a lot of stuff and, you know, took his time with me. And, but it was like, you know, I'll never forget the first day that I properly started working and he was just giving me the run through on the shop. Cause it was like, at that time there wasn't a lot of shops in Toronto, right? Like no. 93. And, and his was like, you know, he was like a proper biker. And he had just come back from Richmond, like from I the think state. So, yeah. 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 Where he had like a bike club and he was the president and everybody died and he was like yeah. the last member, you know? And so it was like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So at that time it would have been like uh beachcombers down and then Toby at accents of skin way cool. And then yeah. abstract arts had just opened abstract, yeah. that year. And yeah. then I don't even think new tribe, New Tribe was probably still in their little spot when Ace opened. So yeah, there's like when you say oh. there wasn't a lot of shops, like that yeah, was downtown that was Toronto. Like that was yeah. downtown Toronto, and that was all on the same Queen Street West, yeah. and they were all like a decent distance from each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember he, uh, you know, you know, how, like you start a new job and they tell you where all the stuff is and what you have to do and what you shouldn't do and. So he's like, you know, he's telling me like, yeah, you know, if you have a disagreement with anybody in the shop, you go out back, you fight. Then when you're done, you wipe off all the blood, you shake each other's hands and you get back to work. And I was just like, okay. You know, I was, I'm never going to have a disagreement with anybody, you know, like. Hey, this is and I remember I like disagreement with anybody in any book. <laughs> yeah. So and I remember to... like. I remember at the time I was doing Kung Fu all the time and I'd gotten in like a tournament and I came into work and I had a black eye and, and then Psycho was all like, he's like, you know, one day he's just like, show me what you got, you know? And I was just like, oh, okay. So then I'm like this, you know, and he puts his hands up, but he, he has this look where he like looked right through me, you know? And I was like, put my hands down. I was like, no. And he's <laughs> like, no, yeah, come on, come on, let's go. And I was just like, no, no, I, I'm good. You know, like. So to make he wasn't going to hold back, you know? He worked with a guy named Crazy Ace and a guy named yeah. Psycho Kid. Yeah. yeah. And then Carl and Ron. Yeah. <laughs> Carl, the colorful, and Ron yeah. went by Dabs. And then they were trying to give me a nickname. They were like, you know, what, what's your nickname going to be? And I was like, how about Just Steve? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I, I didn't have anything, you know? I was like, they were all super heavily tattooed. And I was like, not you know and it was like i'd yeah. come out somebody wanted to get tattooed and pick flash off the wall and i'd come out of the back room and and they'd be like no no i don't want that guy you know i want i want that guy with the beard give me that guy you know and so but yeah it was awesome that was an awesome time and i was there for like three years and it feels like a decade at least you know like i can't believe how much i did in those three years like ace had us traveling to conventions you know like i went so many times to Europe and traveled all around. Like we even did like a road trip where like we flew into Paris and got a motor home. And then we drove around, we went to Bordeaux in France and then we went to Amsterdam and then we, um, oh God, where did we go? And then Germany. And then we drove all to Paris. No, 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 no. No way in Finland. No, no. And then we no. drove back to France and then we flew to Russia, Moscow, the first ever Moscow convention. I think it was 94. And that was crazy. It was like, you know, armed guys with AK 47s walking. Like we walked through, you know, that in movies you see the, it's, it's not the Kremlin. It's, you know, the thing like with all the like round domes. Yeah, it's the Kremlin. Yeah. Is that That's the Kremlin? Kremlin. Yeah. 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 We like walked across that square and stuff. And there's all these like, you know, crazy military guys. And I remember I had my skateboard and um, this photographer from like International Tattoo, he was like, oh yeah, I wanted to get you like skateboarding across there, you know, and do some tricks and stuff and I'll photograph it. And I was just like, no, no, I don't want it. Like, you know, it's too scary. And like, 
And I remember um, Ace went to dinner with some guy that was like, you know, found out he was in town and he was kind of like iconically famous there because he was like in all these biker magazines and stuff. And, um, and he went to see this guy and this guy had a collection of like tattooed skin lamps and all this stuff real creepy. And Ace came back creeped out and that took a lot. Like that guy was scared of nothing. And he was all like, you know, we're, we're not going out at nighttime here. You know, like Moscow at that time was like the murder capital of the world. And so it was like so hardcore, you know, and I got tattooed by Philip there on my forearm. And uh, so okay, I got I to meet Philip. Huh? Uh, uh, before you get too far into this, I want to know what yeah. it was like being in an RV with those guys traveling through. Yeah. Europe. And who was on oh, that trip? Like, it was uh, it was Ace, myself, and then Carl and Ron. And then Ace's buddy, I can't remember his name. He was kind of like helped us like Kevin, maybe he helped us like set up and tear down and stuff like that. And so we all stayed in this motor home. And I remember like, you know, we kind of alternated beds and like one night I had to sleep in the same eight, uh, bed as Ace. And it was like a little bunk bed. And I, I didn't move. I was like, I was so terrified. You know, I was like, totally like with my arms in my thigh. Like this. And like in the morning, he's like, Stevie sleeps like a log. Didn't move at all. But I was just like terrified, you know. But yeah, it was so random. We were driving around and like, you know, we'd pull over and camp and and I remember I, I drove the motorhome on the autobahn and it was like I had it absolutely floored like to the ground. I've never done that with a car and it was like, you know, cars are zinging by you. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was man. awesome. It was such a different time yeah. back then, eh? Like Oh. Yeah, yeah, and the Moscow thing was crazy too because it was like I, I remember like seeing I got, a picture of you guys in the International Tattoo Magazine, and oh, I was yeah. like, "Oh yeah. my god, all well, those guys from Toronto were there!" Oh, I was so yeah. so jealous. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome, yeah. and like nobody had any money, right? And like Philip wasn't working; he was sitting there because nobody had any money. So tattooers were like started to get tattooed by him because they were like, "Oh, here's my chance," you know. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and I got tattooed there, and I remember I was getting my tattoo on my forearm, and then there was this like street kid that was hanging out at the convention, and he had all these facial tattoos and all these different tattoos, and they were like kind of bad. And so then Luke Atkinson was working with Philip, and he decided, you know, oh, I'm going to fix this kid's tattoos for him a little bit, right? Like at least the ones on his face, just for free. Just so he wanted to do something, right? So he gets the kid in the booth and he's tattooing him and fixing his tattoos for him. And then he steps out of the booth and the kid grabs the machine and starts tattooing himself with it. Because he had done all his tattoos himself, right? But with like hand poke and stuff. And he's just like, ah, what are you doing? And then he's like, hey, that's pretty good. And he's like, hey, do one on me. And then next thing you know, he gets a tattoo from the street kid, random nameless street kid, right? With... And then Philip looks over and he's all like, oh, hey, I want one too. So while he's doing my tattoo, he goes over and gets this tattoo, like an anarchy symbol from this punk rock kid, right? And Amazing. Hanky Panky got a tattoo from him. And I forget who else. Like, it was like crazy because they were getting their souvenir tattoos from this Russian punk rock kid, right? That's amazing. And, yeah. And I remember Philip, you know, because he was in the middle of my tattoo and he gets this tattoo on his wrist. And he comes back and he's like, oh, that hurt, that kid hurts. And then <laughs> over his shoulder, Luke has the machine and he like hangs the needle and he shows me and he pokes it out and he hung the needle out so far, like for Philip. And he's going like this way, like that, you know? <sighs> they were just like kids, you know, pranking around. And it was just like, it was like my mind was blown because here's the guy that's the guy, you know? Yeah. He still is, right? But yeah, at that time, you know, it's the guy. And then here they're like goofing around doing like free tattoos. And it was like, yeah, it was awesome. Oh. Yeah, we got like kicked out of the hotel and because of Ace. And he like punched out the the organizer. He like punched him out and stuff. And it was crazy. Yeah. What was yeah. the what was the <laughs> tattoo scene like there? Were there any Russian tattooers at the convention? Like now it seems to you know. Yeah, there's amazing tattooers in Russia, right? Like, I, totally. and at the time, I, I only remember seeing a few. And I remember there was a guy at the convention that had a homemade tattoo machine that he made out of like an electric toothbrush thing, and it was like guitar string thing. It wasn't even like a needle 
and somebody gave him a setup and like wow. it was very early days, I guess. Like maybe there was other people there that I just, you know, I didn't look around that much. I was trying to work. Ace was just like, you know, you got to work and yeah, I saw what I saw, but amazing. Yeah. But yeah, so, there's incredible tattooers there. Now it's a, it's yeah, crazy. It's amazing. I'm across yeah. some like people and it's like second year tattooer. And it's like, what? Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And yeah. doing tattooing where it's like, that shouldn't be possible. Yeah. But yeah. Some of the stuff yeah. is just crazy. But uh, so, yeah. so there was a bit of a bit of the misinformation mishap of you leaving way cool and toronto do you want to touch on that yeah sure <laughs> before yeah, we get into all the new fun stuff i love these yeah, stories yeah. These great. <laughs> yeah i remember aaron kane was in um whistler and i went and got tattooed by him and um and so i kind of started like a bit of a back and forth with him like getting to kind of know him and I, I totally idolized you know like that whole san francisco scene like aaron and marcus and all those guys oh, and yeah. um so just to you know get a chance to get tattooed by him and some of my friends knew him and so that was great and then i went back to toronto and then he contacted me and he said like hey i'm going down to sf for a while you know do you want to come out here i have a spot set up and you can work on your friends because at the time i was going out to whistler all the time and snowboarding and tattooing people you know in, in their uh, hotel room or whatever you know and and then and then fly back to Toronto and work. And cause I think I had a girlfriend out there at the time, but, um, and, uh, and then, so on one of the trips, Aaron had set up this like working space inside a hair salon where there was like a whole room where it was a tattoo room and it was awesome. And, um, so I was tattooing there and I had to give the guy a cut. And so Ace found out that I give somebody a cut. And so that's pretty much like, you know, like I think the way the rules were as far as like a biker shop, it's like they own you. You know, it's like I pay him. I make the money. I pay him. I don't pay somebody else because nobody else can get money that I made. So he was mad. And while I was away, somebody had run out of black ink and they said, oh, Steve took all the black ink, which I didn't. I had my own bottle of black ink. I didn't, you know. And then somebody else passed up some work and they said, oh, Steve passes up work all the time. And I didn't. Like, I only did whatever walk in, you know. I was just starting to get some people coming in for things that I was drawing, you know, but very rarely. And so it just happened, you know, a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, I hear that Ace is mad. And they're like, you know, I check in at the shop and they're like, Ace is mad at you. You're fired. Like, don't come back or take your time. And I was like, what? So then I come back and I phone him up and he's just like, mad. you know, he tells me all this stuff. And I was just like, you know, I didn't know about paying somebody else. Like it wasn't my space. It was, you know, he said, you know, but that's not cool. I said, okay. And then he said, what about this ink? And I said, you know, it wasn't me, you know? And I was like, what about passing up to work? And I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. And he's like, okay, well you can have your job back. And I was like, I don't want it back. I'm like, all these people, said all this stuff about me. I work with these people, you know? And I was like, I think I was hurt, you know, like that they just kind of threw me under the bus. And then at the same time, I had this opportunity to go work with Aaron. So I was like, oh yeah, I had this opportunity to go work with Aaron Kane. You know, he's like a world-class artist. I could really learn a lot. Oh man, you know, this is the wrong thing to say to Ace, you know? Like world-class. And he's like, what do you think we are? And he was mad. And then it was just like, you know, he's like, you got to get out of Toronto. Like, if you open a shop, I'll burn it down. You know, and he's just like, I could send guys after you to break your arms and legs, but I'm not going to do that. I could send guys after you to, you know, destroy your car, but I'm not going to do that. Like, stuff like that. Like, I was like, I was scared. For years, I was really scared that, uh, you know. And the hard part was about it was that, like, I really saw him as, like, a mentor father figure. Like, I really cared about him. You know, like, I know he was scary and stuff like that, but he was also, like, a really good man. And he really cared about tattooing. Like, the way he set up yeah. his shop, you know, he did these, like, six-hour shifts. That was the maximum you could work. And, you know, he everything was important to him. Like, I think he was as clean as a shop could be back then. Like, he was kind of ahead of the curve. 
Yeah. And, you know, and I got all these opportunities to travel and it was just like, you know, I remember like, I have great regrets actually, like the last year that I was there, I remember I went to go see him because it was Christmas time and he was by himself, him and his dog, Louie. And I went to the shop and I said, hey man, do you want to come to my house for Christmas? And he was like, you know, no, you don't want me there, you know? And I'm like, no, yeah, I really, I want you there, you know? And he's like, no, you don't want me there, you know? So I was like, okay, you know, I'm not going to push it. And then it was like, I think my parents split up and that was the last proper Christmas I had. And it, and I think, oh, I should have pushed hard, you know, because then a little while after that I was gone and I lost touch with them. And then it, well, next thing I heard was that he, he died, you know, and it was just like, oh, you know, you kind of have regrets of those those moments, those little key yeah. moments. But yeah. 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 When when he first opened Way Cool, I was at Art of Torture and mm. I wanted to go check the shop out because like I had seen him in tattoo magazines and stuff too. I walked in, yeah. the shop was quiet. I don't think I don't even know if Dave and Carl were even there yet. Like it was literally only like a couple weeks old. And he yeah. was so fucking nice to me. Like oh, yeah. so I told him I was a tattooer and where I worked, he was like, Come on in the back. Took me in the back was showing me pigment that he had he was showing me he's yeah. like have you seen uv ink and oh like, yeah I'm yeah like, no i haven't because at the time i hadn't seen it and he's like Check yeah this shit out and he brings it all out and he's like little cap of that i charge 80 bucks and i was just like yeah he's like, you got to get yourself some of that but you guys find it and i was just like but he was yeah. so fucking cool to me he was like so nice for like there's been so many people like that in, in my career where i'm like i don't know why they were fucking nice to me and they were just yeah nice to me you know what i mean like he was a yeah you know, yeah he was a rough scary dude but like yeah if you thought you liked tattooing and you weren't yeah, yeah. To his bottom dollar then he was cool like yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah. loved it he loved it you know almost more than most people i know today yeah. rich yeah. hanford's a close second he loves tattooing too that guy will <laughs> go on about it forever right but yeah he yeah, at the time you know he was like yeah, he was great that way. And he just seemed to know everybody and there was a lot of opportunities and he had stories, you know, like crazy stories all the time. Yeah. His legacy yeah, cool. in Toronto is pretty enduring too. Like there's so many people went through uh, yeah. shops and ended up opening shops of their own. Like there's a good chunk of Toronto that is populated with shop owners at this point that learned or worked through his shops. Like, does he have yeah, or somebody that worked there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Aaron Kane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then Aaron, I, I yeah. went out west Whatever. and started working with Aaron. Just yeah. Which was uh, yeah. you know, amazing, right? Lucky. And he was like snowboarding and stuff too. Like he was into that whole culture as well. So we just kind of like hung out a bit. But he was kind of back and forth from San Francisco. And even when he was in Whistler, he was kind of there more to – you know, kind of hang out with friends and party and snowboard. And he wasn't tattooing that much. But then when he did, it was like, you know, like the first time I saw him doing that uh, gold spiral kind of bi biomech stuff, like he was doing it around that time. Like I think he had done some Sean Palmer graphics and then had adapted it into tattoos. And I have like, you know, a piece of my forearm that I got in like 96. And it was like, you know, just, I don't understand it, but you know, it's so cool. And it was like, I want that. Give me that. You know, <laughs> yeah, give me, give me some more of that. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was really cool. I actually remember him showing one of his friends like, oh yeah, yeah. Show him your arm, Steve. You know, and he's like, yeah, that's my new stuff. That's my new stuff. And he was all psyched about it and made you feel so special. Like you were like, oh, you know, a <laughs> special thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you still have a good relationship with him till to, like right now, right? Yeah, I haven't been in like for a while. I was going to see him like every six months, you know, minimum every year. But then I think when I moved to the island and had Walker, you know, and stuff, it was like I stopped traveling that way as much to do guest spots. And then I kind of lost a bit of touch with him. And then he moved to California, which is closer, but then. I've only been down there a couple of times. I've actually been meaning to, I've been talking to him like through Instagram a little bit. Yeah. And he keeps saying, you know, like, come down. So like, I love that, you know, because I really want to go 
back down there and hang out with him, like just to be around him is inspiring. You know, like he's motivated, he's talented, he's just like, he's just a good, solid human being, you know, like every time I've gone there, it's been like, uh, I've learned something, whether it's, you know, tattooing or machines or just like life stuff. Like I remember before Walker was going to be born, he had his son. I don't know if his second son was born yet. I think, I think he had his one son that was a baby and then one on the way. And I went down there to hang out, you know, to build machines and stuff, but also just to see what is it like having a baby? How do you do that? You know, and it was like a practice run. And then I went back and had a baby and then felt like I got that, you know, and then I took a trip down there too with, with Walker when he was only 10 months old and the kids played together and, you know, it was like, um, yeah, it was pretty awesome. Like I've, yeah, he's such a great guy. Like so generous with me through the years, you know, like it's funny cause you know, when I would see him every six months, you know, I would work, I'd tattoo so hard as much as I could try to do cool stuff, you know, and then I would go there and I would show him and I just wanted him to be like, nice, you know, but he, no, never. He was always like, how come, how come you did this color here? Like you should have done it over here too. And why don't you do this? And like, he was always with the critique, but his critiques were hundred percent. Like, you know, all the stuff you kind of think, I hope nobody sees this part where I kind of you know, fudged this part over to hide the bad part or, you know, whatever the weak area he would, that's where he would look right away every time, you know? And so I would try harder and harder just to get the something, you know, some praise. I never got it. And then years later, when I sort of wasn't talking to him as much, I remember I, I distinctly remember I picked up Walker from school and we went to go get some sushi and I popped open Instagram and there's, this back piece I did, the one on Christina, the Yorogumo, the spider lady oh, back piece. Yeah, yeah. And Aaron had reposted it. And he was saying like, you know, Steve's one of my favorite tattooers. Like, this is amazing, blah, blah. And I was totally like, oh. and I cried. Like, I cried, you know, like in the sushi place. And Walker's like, what's the matter, you know? And I was just like, I couldn't even explain it. Like, I was just like, I, you know, it's this is something I never thought I was, I gave up. Yeah, yeah. to impress him because I was never going to impress him. And then boom, you know, and it was just like, oh, I don't even know what to do with that. You know, like it's that kind of stuff is like, huh? first hug from a dad as an adult is hard. <laughs> yeah. I, w- I was going to say, I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that you still look for mentorship. Like at, at that point yeah. in your career, there's most people would assume that you had no mentor or no one that you looked up to or chased or looked for input from, but, that's not the case. Like, mentorship. No, I think every, I think everybody has mentorship, and everybody has the what's the imposter syndrome, and you know, like lots of times people are like, "Oh yeah, I really love your work," and and then I, now I kind of ask people, "What do you like about it?" Because I just kind of want to know. Like people would be like, "Oh, I love your style," and I'd be like, "Oh, what's my style?" You know, like I just now I kind of know. Like I feel a little bit more confident in it and stuff. But like when I went down to uh, uh, Columbia in September, I got to do this talk down there and they invited me down. And, and I remember thinking like, oh, I don't really know how I'm going to contribute contribute here because all the speakers were really good. And a lot of the people really seemed to have it dialed too, you know? And um, and then it was, it was really interesting because people were like a little standoffish at first. And so I thought, oh, nobody really knows me, right? And then I went up and I did my talk and at the end of the talk for like the other people, there'd been maybe like five or six talks so far and, and people are like, Oh, you know, it's good. Right. And then I went up and I did my talk and then I felt good at the end of it. And I felt like emotional. Like I was like, I hope I don't cry up here. Cause I don't know if that's okay in South America for a man to cry on stage, you know, not and right. Yeah. And then so, <laughs> and so everyone, and then everybody stood up and they were all like, oh. And I felt this wave of energy and I was totally like, whoa, like it was really overwhelming. There was like a clip that they put together and, and it showed that moment. And I was so like, oh, and then afterwards I had several tattooers come up to me, like crying, saying that was amazing. I got so much out of it. That was like really inspiring. And I was like, what? Cause it's like, you know, everybody feels like they're struggling, right? All the time. Like yeah. you try your best, you, you do what you can. And then, 
you're like, I hope that's good enough. I hope my client likes it, you know? And then when you're halfway through the tattoo, you're like, I know I'm going to color this like this and this like that, but I have no idea what I'm going to do there. And so you keep putting it off until you get to the end. And now you've painted yourself in a corner and you have to figure it out, you know, and then usually you figure it out and then it all comes together and, you know, but it's a stressful, anxious process. Right. Yeah. And, um, it's so cool to, when you're in it, you don't appreciate that everybody else is in the exact same thing. And sometimes when I talk about that, like what the times that I've got to stand up and talk to people, like I so nerve wracking, like I don't sign up for that stuff. Like, and you know, social anxiety stuff. But every time I've done it, the fact that I've shared with people that I feel anxious and that's kind of part of my process that I, you know, I have to work hard on my drawings and do color studies so that, you know, while I'm, when I'm in the tattoo process, you know, a lot of stuff is finished so that I can just focus. And, you know, the time of being an artist was in the preparation, you know, and then now I'm a tattooer, like Bill Baker would say, you know, like I'm a technician. Like I look at my drawing and I just, you know, technician, like how does yeah. the machine work? You know, how's it working? And the anxiety goes away. Like if I don't prepare enough and I have to like figure out on the spot, like what color goes where and stuff, you know, then I'll start to sweat, you know, even now, like, so, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know if you guys are like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. at all. No, yeah. no preparation and sweating every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of a working, working with you in the nineties was just like, I should probably do color studies. I'm still saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's hard. But you know who that's from? You know who I took that from? The, the unnameable. Yeah. <laughs> from Driscoll. He, Driscoll was always like doing color studies. And I remember thinking like, wow, he put a lot of effort into those pencil crayon renderings, you know? Pencil crayon. And I think I started, I started yeah. to do pencil crayon renderings. And then I got carpal tunnel because I was like, you know, smashing those pencil crayons all the time. And yeah. 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 You know, it's hard. You have to know what a ladybug looks like before you tattoo it. So <laughs> I was there when he got those ladybugs from Aaron in Florida. Yeah. Which was awesome. You know, and then he started doing ladybugs all the time too. But yeah, that, that yeah. was a great, that was a great experience to watch him get those from Aaron. Was that the time you were in Florida and you guys went to Key West? Yeah. yeah and and you Brian did. came out and got tattooed by Aaron too. So I watched yeah. Brian get. This leg yeah. done and yeah, and you guys went and tattooed at like the point, right? Uh, like the most paradise? southern point. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We went outside with flashlights and battery yeah. packs, and we tattooed yeah. each other on the southernmost point of the United States. Yeah, we got all the like little miniature southernmost point tattoos. But yeah. I have mine on my right above my foot because I figured that was the southernmost point of my leg. That's <laughs> what I got there. <laughs> I remember you telling me when you came back, you were so excited about that trip. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was cool. That yeah. was cool. Yeah. yeah, I remember Aaron saying like, man, we got to do this all the time. Like, you know, we could get tattoos of the Golden Gate Bridge while we're driving over the Golden Gate Bridge or a palm tree while we're sitting under a palm tree. You know? But now it's like now everyone's got the battery pen. It's like you could probably get tattooed anywhere, but I don't know yeah. anyone that's done that recently, but I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's somebody. We. I just went on a fishing trip with Ben Burlock and Dean Carroll and we brought all our tattoo gear to tattoo and it was fucking 43 degrees and <laughs> nobody was, oh, man. nobody no. wanted to get tattooed. It was like, fuck that. <laughs> no, no. That's so oh, yeah. One day. <laughs> all right. Well, you, you touched on it yourself, like with your process of like your color size and all that stuff. Can you tell us a bit about your process and how you came to do that and, you know, where you started and where you are now with the process, have you evolved, et cetera? Like right from consultation. Consultations. Um, so I think consultations are huge. Like I, every opportunity I, I can have someone sitting in front of me and I can talk to them and bounce ideas back and forth, you know, like I, I like to do that. And I like to, you know, sometimes you get people and they're like, yeah, do whatever you want, you know, do mm. your thing. Yeah, that scares me. You know, it's too it's too open and it's like I don't yeah. believe you cuz you're cuz it's like yeah, do whatever you want 
as long as it's a lady with fabric and some flowers and you know like they have a list they just haven't told you you have to mind read you have to know right yeah yeah um so i try to ask a lot of questions like if somebody wants a figure it's like oh is it a female figure yeah oh what color is your hair is it long is she smiling is she intense you know like i ask like and then i take all the notes and i do little thumbnail sketches usually on the spot and they're usually like pretty garbage, but just fact, right? And then I'm just like, okay, you know, now I got it. And then so in three months or whatever, when I go to do that drawing, I have all that information and I have the little thumbnail and I usually try to go off that as much as possible. And I do it like everybody else, I collect reference or like I make reference, you know, like stand in front of the camera and do that and stuff. And I have a lot of photos of me like this. Katie was like saying like, oh, you should put together a coffee table book of yourself. You know, where I'm like, that would be amazing. All these like, <laughs> things. But anyway, and, um, You're and then, you know, I, I yeah, usually, geez. yeah, yeah. And then so I, uh, you know, I'll do like little thumbnail sketches and then I still don't draw on the iPad. I draw on paper and I'll usually, if I'm doing a back piece, I shrink it down to half the size. Like I just literally use a formula, like, you know, if someone's back is 40 inches long, I make it the tracing 20 inches, you know, and I, and I scale everything down, then I do the drawing. And then when the drawing is finished, then I blow it up for whatever reason, the math works. It's not 200%, it's 190%. And for some reason that I just found that out by trial and error. And then I blow it up and then I do my line drawing off the big one. Like I had. I don't know if you can see this, like, like, like these, wait, like this drawing. Can you see that on the screen? Which yeah. one? So I, I, I guess that one in the middle. Okay. Black and gray one. Like yeah. That one, you know? And then, is this going to make everything weird? You know, and then this is like more like full size. Jesus. And it's like a big line drawing. So it's like a whole leg sleeve. And then, um, so I do that, I do the miniature drawing, then I blow it up and do the tight line drawing to size. And then usually I'll take my half size original drawing and then I'll shrink it down again to half that size and do my color study. Cause that forces me to make simpler choices with colors. Oh, oh. I, so right. I by design, yeah, I by design draw very tightly. And sometimes I don't appreciate how tight I draw and it's not very transferable to tattooing as far as longevity. So I force myself to do it a different way. I draw tight in my natural setting and then I blow it up. So it's more tattooable. Huh. And then by drinking the color study, you know, I, I can see the entire composition in my field of view. So when I'm making color choices, it's, balancing by everything that I can see. Whereas like if I made a color study that was bigger, you know, I'm coloring something blue down here and then I'm coloring, you know, it's like, I'm, I can't, I can't balance it as I'm working. And it's like the iPad is kind of a cheat for that because, you know, you can just shrink it down and, and see the balance of everything. Yeah. I, I imagine that's why there's so much progression lately with people or part, one of the reasons, you know, with iPads is because you can do this like, shrinking down and see your composition and then blow it back up and you know tweak the details and all that stuff i, I still blow I, composition anytime i draw on the ipad yeah i can take I a picture of thing do it yeah. all print it off and then i'll go put it on my original tracing and i'll be like that's so not even close i yeah. don't know i just yeah, yeah sticking the paper i'm too old to learn it's, your trick. it's like you can you get Sometimes it, because you can zoom in, you get too tweaky, you know, and then when yeah. you actually print it out to the size that you need it, it's like, oh my God, this is a, so detailed, you know, like what have I done to myself? <laughs> so that's why I, I do that process. And I heard about that from Scott McEwen because he said that Eddie Deutsch would do back pieces that were like this big, you know, and then blow them up. And then I heard Philip Blue also did that. He would do like miniature compositions and then blow them up. And it took me a long time to actually apply that because it always felt like if the tracing was this big, that's how big I had to make the drawing. But it's like 
hard. It's very difficult. And if you do that one step to shrink it, you know, everything improves for me anyways. Yeah. You know, just because you can see it, you see the, the weights and the balance and the, you know, where your lighting is and what needs to get pushed and what needs to get pulled and, you know, time management. I mean, time management. And, you know, once you get carpal tunnel, like, you know, I was waking up for months and in the morning, my hands would be like this and I would have to like, you know, straighten them out and I had to wear a brace. And then it was like, okay, I can't do it that way. So I think that was even in late nineties, I got that the first time. And then it was like, okay, well, I can't work six or seven days a week. I should work, you know, four or five days a week. And then that gives me two days to draw, you know, and then that was kind of balance, balancing better. And then I think I started to do bigger pieces, not because I wanted to do bigger pieces, but because time management, you know, if you do one back piece drawing and you spend a whole day on it or a whole two days on it, and it takes you 40, 50 hours to tattoo it, it's much better time management than doing, like I remember doing eight drawings a week sometimes, right? For eight appointments and they were, yeah. you know, it would take me four or five hours to do some drawing and then it would take me two hours to tattoo it. And it was like, you know, that's, that's hard. You're always doing homework and you're always putting so much energy out that it's like you get depleted, you get burnt out. You know, I got burnt out a couple of times where I was like, had absolutely nothing left in the tank. I remember you got burnt out one time too, Dave, right? Is that oh, yeah. a year mark? Usually, yeah, I think it was more like five years. Yeah. 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 I've been burnt out a whole bunch, but that time was, that was tough. But that was, yeah. that was just working alone and the self doubt, the imposter syndrome, and uh, yeah, just, you know, running away to other things and trying to distract myself. And... Yeah. Which is important too, right? You got to do other stuff in life. You got to have like, work life love balance you know like if you if you put it all into tattooing then you know you're it kind of yeah. drains you too right well yeah, think, balance is the key i think it's a big problem too because a lot of tattoo there is a problem in tattooing i think is where uh we identify as tattooers and there's a yeah if you have imposter syndrome and you identify as a tattooer you're setting yourself up for a really horrible existence because you'll never mm -hmm. feel like you measure up. You'll never feel like you measure up to other people, let alone your own expectation. And then you have yeah. an existential crisis where you're like, well, what the fuck am I? Like, yeah, if yeah. I'm not good at this and I don't think I'm a, a real tattooer or whatever, like what good, like you, you see yeah. the problems in the industry. Like we've all had friends who have quit. I've quit. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Worse, like severe depression, you know, Yep. alcohol drug abuse and suicide, sure. suicide yeah. and yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah there's yeah. a lot of i mean there's a lot of pressures and you can put more pressure on yourself by just how difficult the whole process is like i i often think about how like i haven't been interacting with a lot of people recently but you know quite often you run into tattooers and they have really big ego and i think it stems from the fact that you know we literally do something that you can't make a mistake every second that you're doing it every second you have to be paying attention and you you can't be sloppy with that you know you got to be confident you got to be like i'm doing this you know i'm nailing it and sometimes that that level of confidence can just slip you know just a little bit and people start to be like i am awesome you know <laughs> you know and then sometimes you're like then you see somebody that's more awesome than you and you're like not nah. Um, you know, like, and, and, you know, everyone gets that too. Right. Cause it's like, like, I remember going to Florida and looking through Aaron's sketchbook, like on the car ride from the Miami convention to, uh, to Key West. And when, by the time we got there, like, and I looked at his book, I was like, I want to quit, you know, like, this is like, I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. But then when I went home, I was like, that's how hard I'm going to try, you know, I'm going to try harder not to be better than him. But just the, like once you see a level that's possible, you you just want to try to get there. Yeah. You yeah. know, not for, and not to, yeah, not as a competition. Like I know the whole competition is a thing in tattooing. Seems to have a resurgence now. People have trophies and all this stuff. But it's like, you know, there should be like a level of competition with yourself. Yeah. You know, like just to be like, how if I really apply myself, and I'm, you know, most of us 
work at it and you, you do like 70% most of the time, you know, you're like, I'm tired. I'm going to get it, you know, but it's like, what does it look like when you do like 90% or, you know, I don't know if a hundred percent is even possible, but it's like, when you really focus, like for me, that's my goal is like, I, I don't draw after work. I don't draw before tattooing. You know, I have on my days off, that's my drawing day. You know, I wake up, I sit at the drawing table. I don't have any distractions. I try to apply myself the best. And when I make the drawing and I am going to present it to somebody, I'm not going to do a redraw. You know what I mean? Like if somebody tells me all the stuff they want and I do the drawing, I put, that's my best effort and I show it to them. If they're like, I don't really like it. But in my mind, I'm like, I'm working towards not leaving holes for them to be like, I don't really like it. I'm just going to present my yeah. best. Yeah. And if somebody's like, I don't like it, I'll be like, great, enjoy your life. I'm not redrawing it. You know what you I mean? Know. Like, that was, this was it. it. This was it. Yeah. 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 So sometimes yeah. I use that as motivation to be like, how, because I can't present something that is not the best that I can do that way. You know what I mean? Like, and sometimes, you, you know, like in the years past, you'd be tired or you'd be a little bit uninspired and you have to get the drawing done and you wish you had more days, but you don't. And here's what you made. And you show it to the person. The person's like, oh. and you're like, I know it's not very good. I'll do another one, you know, <laughs> but, but I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to waste people's time. I don't want to waste my time. Sometimes yeah. I think of like, um, I don't know if you've ever heard this theory with yogis uh, that, nope. you know, they have, um, they say your life is measured in breath. Like you have so many breaths predetermined and that's the, the amount of breaths you get and that's it. And then you die. So for yogis, you breathe longer to extend your life, right? I heard this theory once and I thought, oh, that's really awesome. You know, and then I think for tattooers, you probably have so many tattoos. You don't know what that number is, but this yeah. is how many you get to do or pictures or paintings or whatever, right? And so you don't want to squander them. You know, it's like if you get an opportunity to do something, like you only get this many. And now I'm like 50, I'm going to be 51 next month. I'm like, I'm aware that I have a dwindling amount of tattoos that I'm going to do or pictures or art or whatever. And it's like, I'm so careful, almost anxiously careful about who I'm going to try to work with to make sure I can do that because I have a ton of back pieces on this wall that are from like five years old. And these people are come in like once a year. And I'm like, I'm so bummed on that. Like, you know, cause I have people that come in, like they'll do like two, three days in a row and they just knock these things out. Like they're motivated. They want to get it done. Like I want to get it done for them. Not that I want people to suffer, but it's as an artist, you want to see yourself make something and make it to completion. Yeah. And then these people that are like, you know, taking their time and they just come in every so often and not as committed like that, like hurts. It's like painful, you know, to like not get to see that completed, especially if there's one more session left or two more sessions and you're like, Oh, I'm so close. You know, like just come in, please. Yeah. Please come in. You know, <laughs> I remember I had a conversation with this dude and he was like, like I started his back piece in like 2016 and I have one session left. And he was kind of dwindling in there for a while. And I was like, I was like, do you know what it's like when you're reading a good book and you know, you're like, you, you want to go back to it the next night. You want to read what happens you know, where the story leads off. And if you put the book down and you pick it up a week later, you know, you can still remember you pick it up a month later, it starts getting a little foggy, you know, six months later, you pretty much got to restart the book. And it's yeah. like, you have my book. <laughs> I was like, please, you know, you have to come in because I'll forget. You know, forget what yeah. I'm doing, you know, and, but I don't know. I guess people don't get that. And, you know, it's just the tattoo. People's yeah. lives get in the way. They got to pay rent and eat. Oh, yeah. That's Could you imagine being a commission thing. painter, but the person you're doing the commission for gets to come and take the canvas away every once in a while? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I go, yeah. so I'm just going to take this unfinished painting That's, home yeah. for a few months yeah. and uh, yeah, take it to when the I beach. get a chance, I'll bring it back. Yeah, take it out of the yeah. get it. Put out in the sun for a little while. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, post a bunch of pictures of it. Yeah. Spending money on yeah. other things. I'm gonna show it to all my yeah. friends and get them to critique it. Yeah. 
Hey, I had some thoughts about my yeah. my image here. Really? <laughs> my friend, my girlfriend yeah. told me my girlfriend draw it like this. this. There are things <laughs> she thinks could be better. Yeah. 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 Oh my god. I'm I glad you like said that. Needs to be an ex girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so Steve Moore, we see so yeah. much influence in your work. And of course we see everybody influenced by your work. Um, Derek Hass, Muka, you know, Dor, so many people. Do you find and do you pull a lot of your, do you pull from tattooers at all? Or are you mostly just pulling from like the contemporary arts and fine arts, et cetera? Like, are you looking at tattooers and being like, Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I, I look at, I look at tattooers but then I put it away. I don't ever have somebody's workout where I'm like, you know, really trying to emulate it. I remember doing that a lot with like Philip Lou in the beginning because he and Marcus Pacheco and stuff, you know, and Aaron too, you know, like I would see something and I didn't understand what they were doing and how they were doing it. So you have to kind of emulate it. But then at some point, you know, if you really look at it long enough and dissect it, you can kind of see, Oh, you know, they're, they're using line weight here in this way, or they're doing this negative space, you know, to achieve this look. And then once you get a concept or a, a handle on the fundamentals that they're using, then you don't need to like try to steal from them. You know, you can yeah. like do your own thing, right? It's like Aaron would always say that, you know, I have so many Lego pieces and I just kind of put them together in different ways and rearrange them, you know, and every once in a while I get a new Lego piece to add to the set. And like, I think about that, like, you know, you look at all these artists work and somebody will do some cool move and I'll be like, Ooh, that's a cool move, you know? And then I try to remember it, but I, I'm not going to like screenshot it and pull it up while I'm doing the drawing. Cause yeah. then I'm going to get disappointed in myself. Cause I'm not going to draw it like that person. Like I actually remember I drew a rib panel for this girl. She wanted like, a, uh, what do you call the old science people that wanted to turn stone to gold and. Alchemist. alchemist yeah she wanted alchemist uh miranda super cool lady and um and i remember talking to her and i i think i just met echo or something and i pictured oh i should try to draw it like echo you know because he does cool ladies and all this stuff and i remember not like i had his work up but i was that's what i was trying to do and then my drawing didn't look like that at all and i was so mad at first i was like ah oh, this sucks you know and then like a couple days later, I looked at my drawing still on the drawing table and I was like, oh, it's actually pretty good. You know, I like it, you know, and then I got to tattoo it and then I really liked it and I still really like it. Like it's like from years ago, but it like me trying to take the flavor, you know, and the inspiration of somebody it made me just change a little bit too, right? And that's the stuff I like. Like, I like it when people bring in cool reference and it's like an art style that's not your own. And then you can just take a little bit of that flavor and then you kind of progress a little bit. And then you get more Lego pieces, you know, in the box. And it's like, you know, like, I love it when people are like, oh, like, I remember this guy wanted to get a propaganda back piece and I didn't really understand propaganda art. I like to look at it. It looked cool. It was really graphic. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do that because then I'll get a handle on understanding, you know, what they're doing. And by doing that piece, I learned a lot. And then it influenced every other piece I made after that because things got a bit more graphic, you know, same like Muka, you know, like where it's like you're not doing all the details or all the rendering, you know, you just kind of make a block of something to just represent something background because it's like, you know, I think I used to do imagery where, the foreground was as tight, as detailed as the background. And then it just looks kind of wallpapery. And then I remember looking at Muka and his stuff was detailed and the background was simple. Color, flat, block, you know? And then I was like, oh, I'm going to start doing that. At first, just because I wanted to be like Muka. But then after a while, I, I realized that, you know, if you want to have a focal point in your work, you know, like if you want a character and the face and the hand is, you know, that's the focal point of the whole tattoo that has to have something in it that nothing else has. So, you know, I'll put all the detail there and some color that's there that isn't anywhere else. And then I'll have lines pointing to it. And then wherever your eye comes in on the piece, 
you know, there's simple blocks of color. There's a huge field of blue or whatever. But, you know, you look right past that and your eye just travels to that's the spot, you know, and it's like worked, you know, like it's like, oh, that's your focal point. Well, how do you do that? Because if you color it all the same, if the background all has black shading and the foreground all has black shading, it's just, but, you know, when you step 10 feet back, there's just flat. Where like you look at Japanese work and it's black in the back. In the foreground, there's no black. It's like a peony. It's just color. You know, black lines, but, and it's like, you know, like it works yeah. great. Yeah. My favorite piece still that I think of all the time of yours is the man wood planing himself. Oh, oh that was a pretty good one. Yeah. yeah from that guy Pete. in Seattle. Down in, yeah, Pete. Yeah, down in Seattle. Pete. He used to always bring that me the case awesome. Red Bull. Before Red Bull oh, was yeah. in Canada, right? He always yeah. smuggle up cases for me. That guy was awesome. I really like yeah. that guy. Yeah. yeah, that was for sure one of my favorites. I remember when I was getting tattooed by Marcus Pacheco in San Francisco, I showed him that tattoo and he was all like, whoa, that's a good one. You know, and that was like Marcus, right? I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, yeah that felt, one. Yeah, I felt good yeah. about it. Yeah, that was the real I'm actually I doing a piece right now that, I feel it's kind of arty like that. It's a little bit different, but it's this guy that's been coming from Chicago and he's been doing like three days in a row and just like hammering through these sessions and stuff. And um, Al, kind of, there's pieces of it. Al? How do you do it? Going through three days in a row. I, I think everybody would love to know this. Well, he is not using any numbing cream. And I think that's actually a huge reason why. I think he's coming in mentally prepared. I think people that sit for multiple days, because I have a lot of people that do multiple days. Yeah. And the people that are as successful at it are the ones that, you know, they're they're traveled. So they're traveling there. They're like, I I paid for a flight, I'm paying for a hotel. I want to make this worthwhile. They're not just gonna cash out at three hours, right? Because they're invested financially. And I think they've had time to prepare. Like they're like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it for a couple of days. So mentally, they're in a different spot than someone who just is local, and they're coming in, and they're coming in after work, and they're tired, and they're like, you know, how long are you going to get tattooed for today? And they're like, well, oh, probably three hours. And guaranteed, when they get to three hours, they're done. Yeah. You know? And probably something I would like to talk about is numbing cream. Yes. Good. I think it's bad. I, yes. 100%. I was using it a bunch. Like I like using Bactine and all. I, I don't want people to be in pain. I want people to be able to go through the process and be as comfortable as, as possible. But the, the end product is the most important thing to me. And if someone's using something that they come in and they believe it's going to help them sit longer and it, it doesn't, and then they, they don't heal as good and it looks bad and sometimes it leaves holes. And you got to touch it up. It's like you've used a chemical that's supposed to make things easier and it doesn't work that long. And then you end up having to retouch stuff and it ends up taking longer. And I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you guys have feelings about it too, but like I, I've been starting to like when people come in, new clients, you know, they're like, Oh, can I use numbing cream? And I've been starting to just say, no, that's like, I'm just like, I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want yeah. people coming in with the pre-deadener. That's the one that bothers me is the pre-deadener. Yeah. You know, they come in wrapped in plastic and I have to peel off a little corner at a time and I'm allowed to work in this spot, you know, and then how, oh, they're like, oh, that's amazing. I don't feel anything. Oh, okay. You know, and then they're like, oh, it's starting to get a bit sore. Oh, that's really sore. You're going to have to move somewhere else. Okay. You peel a little more plastic off. You wipe that off. You start working over here, you know, and you, you never really get it done because you're you're confined yeah you know you literally have one hand tied behind your back and you're confined to the small space and your hands slipping around in this goo and you know the skin is already saturated with this chemical that when you're trying to push more ink in i think the space is already taken up with the fluid and chemical that the, the ink just doesn't go in the same way you know it's like the skin isn't as elastic Right, like it becomes no, really hardened no. and rubbery, and I think it doesn't allow yeah. you to pull the pigment doesn't get pulled off the needles as effectively. Yeah, I've got no, yeah. but it's actually getting pushed up the needles. Yeah, yeah. right. I've yeah. got some large yeah. black work from Michael, and we used yeah. some of it. We used numbing cream, some of it we didn't. 
you can tell yeah. where we used it. Yeah. It, yeah. It's not as uh, saturated and it had bad heels. You know, the yeah. body just like it's, it's almost better if someone just will say, you know, I can only do two hours, you yeah. know, and come in and just do two hours, then goop up with a whole bunch of stuff and they still only do two hours, yeah. but now they heal bad, you know, and they like, and the lidocaine is is actually a is really bad for you. It's not good for oh, your. Is it? Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, 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 yeah, I have heard that. Yeah, I've had some real uh, bad cases of leaving the studio and having to pull over because they were having heart palpitations because they cake themselves in it. Like you're only yeah. supposed to use like. Uh, yeah, even doctors thing. will say that. I remember I had a client that was using Emla all the time, and his doctor told him that it's not meant to be used on a surface larger than the palm of your hand yeah and that you can overdose past that and i think there was a lady some years ago like maybe a decade ago that died apparently she put it on her whole leg saturated her whole legs to get whacked and then had a heart attack or something and i was yeah. like i i never followed up on that but it's like i know that it's not good for people yeah. and so i, I don't want to be the cause of someone oh yeah you know i just want I don't, to draw pictures on people i don't want them you know like i don't know if you remember this uh, it, you know Eve, but back in like the late 90s um we were getting like a like a salve made by the girls next door at sacred heart yeah yeah right? and then people were using i don't know what numbing cream they might have been using emla back then they were using stuff and i remember yeah. you even back then saying to me like you know what i think we need to know when the body is telling us that it's had enough yeah totally because we yeah. can just keep overworking it and then that's when we're seeing our tattoos coming back not healing well and it's because yeah. the body just hasn't been able to actually react and respond to the trauma that's been caused because it doesn't know yeah. actually how much trauma has been caused yeah right? yeah and I, yeah, yeah that, was, yeah. that was a long time ago i remember you talking to me about that so yeah yeah so your feelings yeah, but, uh, you hate you hate numbing creams just as much as you hate negative space in your tattoos we got it we got it i used to like negative space i used to use it all the time <laughs> i know but i i think i would use it i think i would use it where I, I couldn't figure out a spot especially on a figure i'm like i don't know how the elbow is supposed to look so it's just negative space you know <laughs> i don't know that hand looks a little bit negative space you know <laughs> Yeah. But uh, then I started being like, okay, I'm going to make a good drawing. And then I didn't want to erase any parts because I was like, I figured all this stuff out. I don't want to erase anything. You know, I know but, Bill used to always tell you, you need more negative space. And you'd be like, no, yeah, I don't. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, it depends on what it is, you know. Yeah. Black and gray, I like it. But color, it's like oh, usually I just want to saturate it all. And, yeah. Yeah. And you do. Just... But, uh, you know, I wanted to go back to how to get people to sit all day. And it's like, Oh, yeah. I'm not sure. I wish I had some magic formula to make people sit because like when I was in Colombia and um, I was sitting beside Julian, you know, Julian the bear, he's like corpse painter on Instagram. No, he does. No, but I will look back up. pieces. He does three day back pieces all the time. Like every convention, he does like someone's whole front 30 hours. And then the next convention is someone's whole back, you know, 25 hours. And he's a really good tattooer and really solid. And he does these things like blocked out, you know, like first day, all this, second day, all that last day, you know. Wow. And, I'm, and he doesn't let anybody use numbing cream. And I'm like, how do you do that? Like I asked them personally, how, oh. where do you find these superhumans? Cause nobody can do this. Like three days. Come on. I've had like a few people that have done, you know, multiple days, but they do like sections at a time, not, whole like 10 hour days like three days in a row like crazy but he's created this thing this environment that he's able to have people who sign up for that and they follow through on it same with this guy waller montero that was a speaker at the thing he would do that he like makes people sign a contract to do like three or four days in a row and they have to pay for all the days up front and then he makes them like have a certain diet you know, and that they um, they use lotion on their skin for like a week or two beforehand to prep the skin properly so that it's hydrated. And he said that's huge apparently for healing, which I still haven't applied too many times to people, but I would like to do that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be smart. I can and, totally see that. Yeah, yeah, like you, because I know that from tattooing women that use a lot of lotion, their skin is always fantastic. Color yeah. throws itself in there. You don't even. It's like you just like you know, um, 
just suggest that the ink goes in? Hi, how would you? I think, so, you know, solid, you, right? You suggest we're like some dude clients? that's out. What's that? What are you suggesting to your female clients? <laughs> well, no, that, that you know that it looks solid, right? But it's like you know, like some dude that's been construction worker out in the sun, and you're like hammering into the skin, and yeah. it's like you you can't force it in there. It's just like no, no, you know. <laughs> but um. Yeah, I don't know. Those people get people to sit all day, and it's like, I know Julian said that, uh, you know, you have to be strong too. You can't show that it's hard on you that you're having trouble tattooing for eight hours or ten hours. You know, you have to be strong, and then they can be strong, and then you just don't present the option of quitting. You don't present that kind of thought of weakness, and then it doesn't happen. Like I know for myself, like I, I think there's times where I'm kind of done. You know, you've been tattooing five hours. You're kind of like, I'm tired. I'm kind of done, you know? Yeah. And then you ask somebody, how long do you want to do? You know, where where do you want to do next? You know, and, and then usually they're kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of done, you know? But it's like, if you didn't do that, if you were like, you know, psychologically, like, well, you can do more. You can do it. You yeah. know, would probably do that too. And sure. I, don't, I don't want to manipulate people that way, but I think that, People have the choice to do that with themselves. Like they can show up and they can be like, this is what I'm going to do. Like all the people I've ever had that sit long and multiple days, they come in focused. You know, like I had this dude from Toronto and he got a full rib panel in six days. That's the most crazy person I've ever tattooed. He did three days in a row, six hours a day, he took three days off and then did another three days in a row, six hours a day. Never took any numb and cream. Talked to me normal. The last 10 minutes I was working on him, he's had a great conversation with me. And he came in at the beginning and I told him like he was trying to pay up front for the whole six days. And I'm like, no, no, no. I just want to get, you know, the money for each day that I do. Like I don't want it in advance. It's like you have to earn it, right? And then and I was like, you know, I got to tell you like you, the first day, you know, it's like I'm rooting for you. Like you did a six hour day on your ribs. Like, whoa. That's awesome. Amazing. It's better than 90% of the people out there. And I was like, but I don't think he can do it. And he looked at me dead in the eye. And he's like, why does everybody keep saying that to me? And he was so, like it hadn't occurred to him that he wouldn't be able to do it. And he wouldn't let himself go there. Like he was just like, of course I'm going to do this. This is what I want to do. This is why I'm here. I'm going to do it. And it was so inspiring, not just on the level of, watching somebody get a tattoo but just like that kind of mentality like imagine if you apply that in everything yeah. you're doing like it's like the tony yeah. hawk like land or slam kind of you know just like you know you, there's no room for failure it's pretty cool yeah it's impressive i know i give my clients outs all the time i i hate her <laughs> so i'm just like you want to call it like sit as long as yeah. you want or as short as you want i don't care like i'm yeah. good yeah uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> drives me crazy Dave, three blocks from the beach i can be done whenever you want <laughs> a block actually <laughs> a block from the beach she's like yeah yeah i'll, I'll go paddle yeah i'll go ride my mountain bike yeah, i'm semi-retired i don't know yeah, yeah. i'm living like i'm semi-retired <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was me the last two yeah, years and now i'm like shit i gotta start working again <laughs> yeah totally uh, yeah that's the cost they eh? like you know, there's the like the hustling to work like crazy, and then there's the making choices to work in the way that you want to work. But there's a cost financially, you know, like yeah, there's always a cost if you draw back your days, you know, and stuff like that. It's like you just yeah, you're not financially a set, but every, yeah, you know, I think I every know. every decision comes at a cost. It's you know, you're always yeah, sure. like something to do something that that's yeah a given, but. I think what tattooers need to do better is analyze what kind of life they want. They're really mm. good at analyzing what kind of tattooer they want to be and what they want mm. to achieve in tattooing. But beyond that, they don't really think past it. And when you're in your twenties mm. and thirties, it's easy to just work, work, work like a maniac to be like, yeah, this type yeah. of tattooer, I want to, you know, make this kind of money. But at some point you're going to be like, life is really what I need to win at here. And how do I, like, what choices do I make now to, fulfill that because how many yeah. baseball tattooers are out there they're just like fuck you know like I yeah fuck. their backs are wrecked and yeah. you know they're like their eyes are ruined and their hands are sore and 
Yeah. 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 And it's like, and then you're, you know, when you're 20, 30, you have your finger on the pulse of what's current and cool, you know, and then as you get older, you get a bit more stubborn and you start, you know, kind of leaving that. Right. And it's like, you can always sort of have some clientele that's interested, but it's like, I, I worry about that. You know, like at some point, are you just totally irrelevant? You know, like I had a thought about the life thing. I remember it was a very distinct moment where I was, uh, I think I just turned 40 or I was about to turn 40 and I was cycling to work when I was living on the island and I was having this whole thought about life and stuff. Right. And I was like literally riding up this hill, like really hard. And then when I got to the, I was thinking about life and how, you know, the length of life. And then I was like, holy shit. And when I got to the top, I was like, I'm 40 years old. I'm like, I'm like halfway through my life, you know, like, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, like people always say that, right? But it's like, yeah. if I'm lucky. And then I started down the hill and I was thinking like, how much time do I have left? You know, like, you know, I stopped on that day. I stopped thinking about, you know, that there was an endless amount of time to achieve all the stuff you want to do. Or like, I don't feel like doing that today. I'll do it tomorrow. And I started thinking about, you know, that there, there is this time. You could see, I could see the time and then it was just like that. Yeah. You know? And it's like, what do you want to do with that time? How do you want to spend your time? And it's like, sometimes that could be like, you know, I've spent a massive amount of my life behind a drawing table, which I'm okay with. You know, I'm really happy with all the stuff I've made and I'm happy to make more stuff. And I, and I like that, but I'm also aware that I want to look outside and I want to go ride my motorbike or I want to do things. And I, I think I always kind of did that a little bit. Like I always had side interests like snowboarding and yoga, and, you know, things like that. Yeah. And, and it sort of like makes grounds you into like, you, you can't only just sit and work because at some point your work loses its life too. You know, the life that you have in your person that you accumulate through all these things that sort of imbues, is that a word, you know, into yeah. your, the stuff you're making. And it's like, if, if all you're doing is making stuff at some point that just kind of runs out and it just starts to look boring and repetitive and dry and you start to look kind of, you know, dry and withered, and, you know? So it's like, whoa, are thing, you right? me now? <laughs> Lotion up. <laughs> Lotion up. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, you know, it's like, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. The life balance thing, I, I think you're on point with that. Like, it is important. You know, you got to do other stuff. Yeah. And everyone's yeah. got their own balance. Like, it's what works for me yeah. doesn't work for you, you know, or somebody else. It's Yeah. Are you still practicing yeah. Ashtanga yoga? I haven't been. I don't know. I had a whole thing when I was, like, on the island. And like, you know, when I lived in Vancouver before, I would go to classes and I was kind of part of this Ashtanga community and it felt really cool. And then for a while, when I went to the island, I got very insulated, you know, and I, and I would do yoga by myself every morning in my basement, you know, and I would, and then I was working in the shop by myself every day, you know, and it was like, it felt pure because it was like when I was doing yoga, it felt very it's not on display. If I fall, no one's there to see it. If I succeed, no one's there to see it. I was literally just doing it for myself. And I felt more connected to it than I ever did. And then when I was working, I think it was also that way. You know, there was nobody else to like impress. It was just my clients and me. And I would have very personal relationships and I really liked it. But it got, you know, just so closed in, you know, where I started to like, leave the shop every day thinking like, is this it? Is this the whole rest of my life is going to work by myself, be, you know, be with my client and then leave by myself, you know, clean the floor every day by myself, clean the toilet every day by myself, you know? And, um, and it was the same way with yoga where it was just like, it just started to feel not good in some ways because it's like, I started to get like, I'm also very obsessive, which has really yeah. helped me. Oh Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really helped me with my work, you know, like you got to make those tight little perfect circles every time you color and, you know, the lines have to be so smooth every time. And, you know, it's, it's good. You can't walk away from a drawing. All that stuff's positive. But then, 
you know, the obsession part for me when I was doing yoga was like, if I could only do a half an hour, it was worthless. And I beat myself up over it. You know, my practice was an hour and a half to two hours. And if I did two hours, I felt moderately good about myself. And if I was doing that five, six days a week, that was my goal, you know? Wow. But then if I did anything less, I would start getting very negative, filtered on myself. And it got to be such to a point that I would have all these obsessive routines that I would have to do. You know, I can't eat before I do yoga, but I have to take out the dog. I have to get my son to school. I have to, you know, and, and by the time I could do my practice, it was like I'd have a very short window and then I would have to have a shower, eat something, go to work, tattoo all day. And I don't know, it started to get a little bit negative and i just have to walk away and i and i lately i've been having the feeling like i want to go back to it because i miss it and i think it helped me be a lot more centered and some of that stuff has stayed in me like physically and mentally it's helped me but there's parts that are missing that i'm not i don't have a practice like they call it practicing yoga and yeah and i think you know if you do that day to day you know you're always checking in with yourself and I do miss that. Yeah. But uh, we stayed together yeah, in know. Calgary for a convention years oh, ago. Yeah. And I remember yeah. you weren't practicing yoga. And I remember by day three, like in my, I was like in my head, like Steve needs to do yoga. Like <laughs> I could see like, you know, the conventions are so draining. Everything else is going yeah. on. We were yeah. eating like, it was great staying with you because it's like, I wasn't going out for the late dinners. We were going to bed early and stuff, but like, you know, you didn't have that part of your routine. And by day three, I could, I could actually see it. So when you talk about huh. that, your obsessiveness and it can turn negative on you because you're yeah. not practicing it. I could actually, yeah. yeah, I remember that. I like vividly mm. remember that. And I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know those OCD traits. Yeah, <laughs> and battling them yeah, and it, life too. Like I, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's all bad. You know, like sometimes no, it gets a negative no, no, stereotype, no. and it can no. be. It can be if you get into very negative spirals. But it's like, yeah, um, you know, there's a positivity to being someone that is dedicated to something. You know, and and maybe that's a different way to spin it. You know, like because I I've never been diagnosed with it. I don't know that I can say that but i know that i have traits of it and i know yeah that it you know a drawing won't let me go like if i'm working on a drawing you know i'm eight hours into it and i'm like yeah i haven't eaten in eight hours like i just got to get up i got to go to the bathroom and eat something and then i'll get to the doorway and i'll look back at my drawing you know and it's just i see something that's wrong with it and it just calls me back and then i'm i'm there again and i'm working on it and then you know half hour later okay no i now i gotta go and then i get up and then i go back and sometimes i'd be like scared to start new projects and new drawings because i know there's going to be a part where i am glued to the thing that i'm making until it decides to let me go until it says okay that's okay you can walk away now like it's resolved enough do you have an, kind of scary hmm? do you have an attachment to those drawings like that sounds pretty intense and if you do have an attachment how do you break that like um, well, I, I keep all my drawings, you know, like I have stacks of books of, oh, oh, there goes my ear, bud. <laughs> Hi, hello, I'm back. Um, yeah, I have stacks of books of all these drawings, you know, and uh, and that's the part that I keep. You know, like it's like I can give away, or give away, you sell, you sell the tattoo to somebody, you know, they own the proper version of it. and. And I keep the drawing because <clears throat> that's all my time and investment is, is in that drawing, you know? And so it's like, I just like to have a catalog of them. And like, sometimes people are like, Oh, can I have the drawing? And it's like, no, that's mine. You know, people <laughs> ask to buy it. They're like, Oh, I want to buy it. I'm like, no, no, it's mine. Like you have that, like that's yours. So. Yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> you got to put a book out of all your, all your drawings. Yeah. Or not all of them, but a bunch. So we can all tattoo like you by just doing your tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's AI now, right? You just do a filter and then boom. Yeah. Where you draw this drawing. <laughs> yeah. Redraw. Yeah. Just give me line work of this drawing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so you used to travel lots, lots of conventions. Are you doing conventions regularly? Do you try and hit a certain amount or specific ones yearly still? Uh, I I was, and then COVID kind of happened and it sort of disrupted that. And yeah. I haven't really gone back on it. Like I realized, I think since I started, I was doing about four, average about four conventions a year. Like sometimes it was a few more and sometimes maybe one or two less, but I was always kind of doing certain regular ones. And I do like them. I like them for the fact that they're very stressful, you know, and it puts you in an uncomfortable position and it's motivating. And then when you go back to work in your comfortable space, it feels extra comfortable. And whatever happened to you in that overwhelming environment, you usually take back with you some positives, you know? Yeah. But um, it definitely is more draining, I think, than it used to be. Like, I get sometimes I have more trouble sleeping at night after convention days, and and it takes me a while to kind of come down. You know, I think the introverted part of me feels like um, exposed and raw. You know, like you have to sort of keep up to it, and then once yeah. you it stopped, you're like, Bleh. you realize how depleted you are. Um, <clears throat> but I. It was a bunch I wanted to do this year, and it just didn't happen. Stuff happened, life stuff happened, and it, it just didn't travel. But I think next year I'd like to try to do a few more again because I do miss it. I do miss traveling and meeting people and being inspired and yeah, opportunities. Are you coming out to Calgary in October? I don't think so. Hmm. No, I didn't really make any plans to. I really I wanted to go to that Austin thing in September, but then oh yeah, I just didn't get back to the people. You know, I was like, I'm sure if you were to call them tomorrow, they would make a booth for you. Matt, yeah, no, I don't. I didn't leave space for it, but it's like I uh, yeah. that one looks really cool. You know, I'd like to go yeah. there, and I miss going to Calgary. Like I, I like the Calgary convention and Winnipeg convention is super awesome, and the Kelowna one's really good. And, yeah, all those ones. I like them all. You've never done the, the Paris one? one? Oh no, yeah. no. Okay, yeah. And but like Paris, and then getting to go to the last London convention before the pandemic, that was like a pretty all-time high situation. You know, like oh god. So I, like for years, I put off going to that convention because probably the imposter syndrome thing. You know, like I got emails, personal emails from Mickey Violetta saying you know, I like your tattoos. You want to come to the convention? And I would just be like, close that email. Like I didn't even respond because I was too, I don't know. I was too scared. Right. I don't I don't want to say yes. I don't want to go just pretend like it didn't happen. And then I got an opportunity to go and sit in the solid booth because Federico um, invited me. He said, you know, if you go, you, know, you can go in the booth. And I was like, okay. So I went and it was pretty awesome. And I was, I remember I was really sick while I was there and I had a bunch of cancellations and some people filled the spot. So it was pretty cool. But Philip Lou was there and I got to see him. And I remember I gave him a t shirt, him and Luke, some t shirts. And a highlight moment for me was at the after party of the convention, I went to this like bar and it was packed, you know, shoulder to shoulder and people dancing. Right? Totally your and environment. I was like, oh, yeah. You know, after a few minutes, I was like, mm. Yeah, I'm out, you know? And so I was just trying to like walk out of there like before I had total overwhelm. And while I'm squishing through people, all of a sudden the crowd kind of opens and there's Philip Lou in the center dancing. He was totally like dancing and he had my t-shirt. He opens up his like button down shirt or something and he has my t-shirt on and he was like, like this. And I was like, and I like walked out of there just totally like, what just happened? You know? It was amazing. Yeah. The, the dancing and the, oh, it was just amazing. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh my God. So. <laughs> and I was like, he, and like, I think when I saw him there, he was like, hey, Steve. And I was like, holy shit, he knows my name. You know, like, <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, amazing. Oh my. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. That convention was epic. It was like every booth. You know, with somebody like, oh my gosh, there's that person. Oh, right beside them, there's this person. Oh, right beside them, there's that person. Like, you know, there wasn't anybody you walked by a booth and you're like, oh, I don't know who that is. You know, it was like intimidating. Yeah. 
That's kind and of... everybody right now just got shocked. Steve Moore gets intimidated no. by other tattoos. <laughs> what? Oh, and yeah. Starstruck. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Kind of the, the perfect segue into our question. Well, oh, yeah. Okay. Th this segue comes with uh it's from Homestead Tattoo. Uh Kevin Pregazer is uh sponsoring this segment. Thank you very much, sir. Dave. Take it away. Steve, who are your top five tattooers all time? All time. Yeah, like Philip Lou. Like for me, it's it's kind of like the guys that first inspired me. Yeah, yeah. It hasn't really changed. And I could probably say like current people too, but like for me, all time, it's Philip Lou, Marcus Pacheco, Aaron Kane, Guy H. and Sin. Oh, you gotta get that last, last one right, because yeah. everybody else sucks. Yeah, <laughs> if you, every person you don't mention sucks. So you're gonna elevate into legendary no. status. Yeah, oh yeah. man, you're like Eminem when they drop somebody in the in the dropping a name. <laughs> you're just gonna either make them or break them. Who is it? Yeah, this is you the... know what? I I think I would have to go into the more current realm and say James Tex. Because uh, just getting to work with him a few times and doing some collabs with him and seeing how he works, it's like impressive, right? Like he's like, he's so efficient and he just draws so quickly and he, he seems to have this like carefree attitude almost when he's drawing stuff. Yeah. He's sort of just like, you know, and it's super awesome. And I remember... At some convention, I think I was at the Winnipeg convention and I was working on something or whatever, right? And I think I'm doing pretty good as far as like how fast I'm getting through it. People are always like, oh, you're a really fast tattooer. And I was like, am I? You know, and I'm working on something. And then I look over and James is starting something, you know? And then I do some hours and look over and he's done. You know, and it was some big tattoo and he's like, it's done. And the next thing I look, he's doing something else. And then I'm still working on the same thing. And I look and he's done that one. You know, and it was like, what the hell? Right? Like, oh, we just saw that. that. Yeah, we just saw at the Edmonton show, and this girl got oh my huge God. thigh, one yeah. shot, huge thigh. Then started her back piece the next day, like lined it, shaded it, and then she yeah. wanted to keep going. And he was like, "No, I already told myself I'm not working Sunday." <laughs> it's just like that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the thing I got to do with him at the uh, at his convention. Right, I and I uh, watched you guys. Yeah, the that Dudley was the show. That was. It cool. was pretty cool. Like, and he, I think he was on no sleep. You know, totally stressed out because to the last minute he was having some like technical issues with the convention, and yep. you know they may, maybe weren't going to let him have it, and you know he was stressed, and he still pulled it through, and like you know we put on these tattoos on this kid, and I was we were only supposed to do it for the first two days. And then I was supposed to do something different on the Sunday, but then he was still good to go. Like we didn't finish and he was like, he wanted to finish. So he was like, Dave, oh, this you was guys. crazy. But so then we, we tattooed him on the third day too. And we finished it up and I couldn't believe it. Cause he was like, just so nice and thankful. Like, you know, it's like people going through a long grueling day and you think they're going to be like, you know, like, uh, and like, complaining and he was at the end of the day he would just be like oh thank you so much thank you for working so hard and you know i'm looking forward to tomorrow and i was just like what i saw him amazing the beer you know? i saw him in the beer gardens on the sunday after you guys were finally done and he was so stoked having a drink me i was just like dude he was just like oh my god he's like he was like just two huge thigh pieces yeah <laughs> done yeah. over three days wow just, yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he Amazing. was cool. That was a really cool experience. And yeah. the other thing I got to do with James was like a back piece like a bunch of years ago. And we thought it was going to take us two days and we did it in like seven and a half hours or something, you know? And it was oh, like... Yeah, that was on that girl, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, I guess that's my top five thing. Yeah. Yeah. You that's knocked that one out. Like that. Yeah. Just yeah. Prepared. I wasn't thinking about it, but... That was it. Sounded prepared. You were like, meep, 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 meep. I think because I used to like people ask a question like that, you know, and so I've had to think about it in the past, but yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and if you go with like your start, mm. it's pretty easy, right? Yeah. If you're trying yeah. to think of like who you got to get influenced now, that's where it's kind of like, oh, totally. uh, who do I? Yeah. There's cool? yeah. There's a lot of current names of you know tattooers that I like, and like I follow a lot of diverse people too that have like different styles, like stuff that I wouldn't even want to get tattooed on me. Yeah. But the way that they do it is like, what the hell? You know, like you can learn so much. Like, yeah. Um, even like a lot of geometric people and stuff. All, like a lot started, of them. Yeah. Like, just I for love the technical it. prowess of it, right? Like, what's that guy? Um, oh, shoot. I just forgot his name. And he pens everything on like he does the red grid. Yeah. It's... You know, and then he like draws it all. Do you know who I'm yeah, talking I about? Something. I saw him do a, it was a knee or something and he stencil or drew it all on. I was like, what? How are you drawing? Yeah, he does every. And like I guess it takes like eight hours to draw it on, and it's like, but it's like how? How do you do that? You that was know, like Bill like, Baker tattoo drawing Pierre's sleeve on, drew on him for like eight, ten hours. His arm was like swollen and everything. And then Bill was drawing. Like, yeah, and then Bill was like, "Okay, uh, don't sweat. I'll see you tomorrow." <laughs> wow. So Pierre yeah. like paper toweled his arm went to bed tried not had a fan on it oh and then they yeah had to you the next day. yeah oh my god that was back at the uh, tattoo arts artistique days that was like that was oh like, yeah I got, you know yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah yeah i remember seeing that um when he got those sleeves fresh and they looked really cool those negative triangles up the wrist yeah like come yeah on. pretty awesome yeah yeah Great bill day. baker yeah. yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, he's our next week guest. Is he? No. Oh, I was like, how? How did you do that? <laughs> I um, I would have to go to Toronto and kidnap him. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, he'd be like duct taped to a chair, and he would just be like going like this. Last time I saw him, I I didn't tell him that I was going to be in Toronto. Yeah, I know that puts too much social anxiety and pressure on him. So I was just like, I'm just going to show up at the shop. And I'm walking down the street, down Kensington, and I see Glennie, yeah. and I see Tim outside, and I see, like, this little puppy bounce around, and I'm like, there's Bill. And I no. start running. I'm not I start running towards him, and by the time he looks and sees me, I was like, don't move, because I knew he was going <laughs> to run in the shop. <laughs> it was awesome. So, yeah, Amazing. he showed me the shop. He showed me the tat shack, and then – took me out for dinner and stuff like that it was what? it was great but then he even said at dinner he was like i'm so glad you didn't call and tell me he's like that just puts so much pressure and and i'm like yeah yeah, yeah. i know i know yeah. you <laughs> yeah i'm not yeah. that do you, you know so. do you think that the anxiety stuff gets worse as years go on with tattooing like it's like a building of anxiety because i feel like i never used to be that anxious about stuff and now i, I feel like it i have it a can happen more often i have a theory that whatever shit you didn't deal with when you were younger ends up becoming your most dominant personality trait as you get older. So if you haven't mm -hmm. done the work, it kind of takes over. You just don't have the yeah. strength wow. to deal with it anymore. It, it slowly evolves right. and just becomes, it just gets out, you know, it's your on it. I am hor I don't, I don't have an answer. I had horrible anxiety up until six months ago. And <laughs> really? I, now I just don't anymore. Wow. Oh, that's great. Yeah. 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 yeah 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 it's definitely a thing right it seems to affect a lot of people yeah i the think more you talk to people and the more honest they are they tend to be you know yeah I have and the, you know, yeah. personal relationships and work and everything like like honestly it's it's the person that i'm with now julia like everything is just like the most calm like emotionally mm. everything like it's just like the most um connected i've been with a person i think has a lot to do with it too you know like i'm just like i don't have any these crazy weird insecurities and like all this other stuff that would like push my anxieties forward which then carries into work and then my anxieties at work would then build on top of those and it just starts kind of like spiraling and stuff so i think waking yeah. up waking up and and smiling and not having that anxiety to even begin my day with has been yeah like mind altering and life altering for me personally. It's, it's wow. been a very 
amazing and weird six months. It's been that I it's great, about, Sean. That I talk great. about her too. Like we're very open with all this stuff. Like I have the I have the best communication that I've ever had with any person in my life, not just in a relationship with friends with anything. Wow. The most open and honest I've had with anybody. And it's been super freeing, I think. I don't and again, huh. like you know, I don't I wouldn't share an insecurity that I would have about somebody or me with that person. But if I have that, I just share it. And then it just, it gets destroyed because it's out of the open. And then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's not real. It's, it's me. It's amazing. It's It's amazing how the things that we don't speak can like get heavier and heavier and carry like so much destructive power. And sometimes just by saying it, when, when you actually just hear your own voice saying something and you're like, it's kind of not that big a deal. Yeah. But yeah. Inside, before you get to the point of saying it, it just feels like if I say this, like I will explode. Like if I say this, I will catch on fire. Yeah. What? If I, if I say this, I'm going to live embarrassment and shame around this person yeah. for the rest yeah. of my life. I can't tell yeah. this person this because yeah. this could be, you know, used against me in the future. It sure. could be held over sure. my head. All these things. Right. And then that comes, that's where like trust issues are coming into play where again, it's mm. not that person. It's yourself usually, and yeah, it's well, yeah. We but, create uh, these tr- we create these internal dialogues, these dramas yeah. based on stuff that doesn't exist. So we create a whole scenario, yeah. and then we act yeah. out on that scenario that doesn't exist in real life. Yeah, we mm-hmm. create enemies out of friends. Yeah, competition out of make- people. Competition. We don't even know somebody, and we're creating competition for ourselves with, uh, yeah. you know, imposter yeah. syndrome. Looking online and looking at other things, you know, and it's yeah. like all getting into our own little yeah. ads and stuff, you know, and we just did a, yeah. a great podcast with Tim Bedron and we touch on some oh, of that cool. stuff and, and talk about mental health and, and his take. Oh, it's on good. That. It's very cool. It, I'm, I'm really oh. excited to have that uh, episode come out next week. Yeah, but, totally. uh, oh, nice. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So oh, sounds good. Yeah. He yeah. does great work. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Well, he draws Watch it because you'll get to watch him draw. You yeah, can't yeah. see oh, him. Yeah. You can only see his hands drawing. Uh, the camera's just over his paper and pen. Yeah, yeah. And he's just talking. Yeah. Yeah. Because he can't, his, ang- he's like, I have so much anxiety. I don't want to be on camera. I'm like, okay. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense because I, I think sometimes when I talk to people, I have trouble consistently looking in, them in the eye sometimes, not for any weird reason, but I've been patterned for 30 years of having deep conversations with people while I'm looking at artwork. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And talking to them as a person, not just trying to like stare them down and have a conversation. And it's, there's a comfort in that that is just something I've been patterned with, you know? And it's, so it's like, you know, I quite often will forget people's names or forget people's faces, even, you know, through like a lot of years of work, the voices, like somebody could like phone me and I'll know who they are based on their voice because I've had yeah, the hours sitting with them, you know, hearing their voice while I'm making their picture, you know, and it's like, it's interesting, you know, like, so I could see how maybe that's a comfort spot where he could be drawing and talking because that's what you do all the time, right? Yeah. You're talking to clients while you're drawing. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, one more question before we let you go here. The one okay. that, you know, coil, pen, neotat. Oh, both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Yeah. Lining yeah, with I coil? Still use, yeah, I still use my coils every day. I never stop using them. And I was using a Cheyenne pen for a few years there. Like, I think I got the first, like, the prototypes before they came out, the battery ones. Ooh. And then more recently, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then more recently, I uh, switched to the Good Guy pen. Yeah. I get a lot of stuff from Good Guy. And I love that Good Guy pen. So yeah, I hear really, really great good. things about like, it. Yeah, it's like it has more. It has a quality too that reminds me a little bit of uh, a machine, like a coil. You know, like it's like has some pop to it, and I feel like stuff that I was getting used to taking me whatever three hours, I could do in two now with the with that good guy pen. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. I like the I guess the longer stroke one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I tried to use mine the other day, and it wouldn't work. Oh, really? Yeah, because they haven't mailed it to me yet. 
Oh, yeah, that's you need that. Yeah, and then the battery has to be on it too to you make it that Rob Jones with the sword. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. I have one right there. Where's my pen? Yeah. Yes. It's a good one. But look at these though. You know? Oh yeah. So you can't you can't let go of the coil. No. Because it's like when I use a coil, I feel like I'm actually tattooing. You know, like there's a sense behind it, like you know, it's like I'm like Aaron's still like my greatest mentor. And it's like, you know, every time I use a machine, I'm like connected to him while I'm doing it. You know, I'm using the stuff he told me. Like it's very like like I don't think I could pass that away. Like I don't think I could disconnect from that. Like I'm sure if I got used to using a pen to do lines, it'd probably make really nice lines. But it's like I like my lines. They look good. They age well. I've seen them, you know, 20 years, 25, 30 years later. Yeah. And it's like, I trust them when I'm using it. I, I trust completely that it's going to do what I want it to. So it's like, I don't know that I need to use something else, but like, I know when I was coloring with coils, I really liked it too, but it would do more damage, you know, for yeah. me, the way I work. And when I use the pen, it just seems a little bit more efficient. And I like that it's quiet and I can talk to people and, you know, yeah. so it's like, are those the Aaron like, Canes? They're just, them? pardon me. Are those the Aaron Canes that you built with him or are those just straight? Yeah. Aaron Canes? Yeah. 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 You've been but, using uh, those forever. Oh yeah. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. Like a bunch of my machines. Like I, I still have a liner from like 97, you know, that I use and stuff. It's like, that's uh, that's also something, right? Like, you know, you have a pen and it will die. Like after a few years, like it will just all of a sudden stop working. It works perfectly. It does one thing perfectly, you know? And then and then it just won't. So it's kind of like, you know, there's benefits to that too, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I like the cordless thing too. It's pretty fun. I like using both it's because nice. then I get the pedal, yeah. I get the thing, <laughs> and then wait, all wait, of a sudden wait. I can go cordless, wait. you know? What? You still use a pedal? Oh, yeah. You still use oh, a yeah. pedal into your yeah. power supply through a clipboard yeah. into a machine? Yeah. Why? I had the same power supply that I had in like 2000 and whatever, one or two. Oh, yeah, like you, can just buy a button. you can buy a button to push in, put in. Just no, I, button. I, re I recently saw someone, I think Dan Kubin started making some machines and he puts the battery pack on the front. Yeah, and suddenly I thought, how come I've never put a battery pack on a coil machine? Like, can you do that? Yep. I've never done it. Like, I'm sure you can. Yeah. So I keep meaning to think like I should do that and maybe rig up a cool side mount or something so that it, you know, the weight's proper or whatever. But I'll probably yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, coils are awesome. I like the noise. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Incredible. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Steve Moore. This has been You're great. Welcome. Yeah. Oh, good. Really. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. It's nice to see you guys. I haven't seen you really much. In a yeah. Well, I, yeah. Just recently, but. Yeah. Know. I haven't seen you since last June, since the Deadly Show. So. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. 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 Long I'll time. Come to nice to connect. Now. I got to get, yeah. get this tattoo cool. finished. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Next time we'll have to do dinner and then we can catch up on more personal stuff that's. Yeah, for sure. Not for public. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'd awesome. Like right cool. On. Thanks so much. And thanks to Good Guy thanks for work. helping us put this out every week. Yeah. And thanks to HoldFastSocialClub.com. Go sign up. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you on there, Steve. <laughs> okay. See you. Thanks. The True North Strong Tattoo Book. This is a massive tattoo encyclopedia of Canadian tattooers. 350 pages. It's an 11 by 17 coffee table format. Sean and Dan worked tirelessly to get this thing out. And sadly, it never made it to print. So it's available for free download at theholdfastsocialclub.com and championtattoo.ca.